Guys, um, welcome to another episode. We have the the, the Twitter famous Luke Broyles who's blown up with his two his two huge threads lately that have really rocked Bitcoin Twitter. Um, just before we jump into them, Luke, do you want to give a quick background of just your journey into Bitcoin and how you came about to write the the first thread? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that, that's that's quite the compliment you have there. Um, yeah, we were just talking before we started recording that we've both been in the space for a little while and. You know, we just we just got on Twitter and social media, and in my case, uh, virtually instantly, um, I it blew up. I posted my first thread uh, one morning, and then by afternoon, it was exploding. Uh, you know, twenty, thirty thousand views, and that for me, I was completely shocked. And it just kept going from there. I'm well over a million views now, probably more like two million views between the threads uh, after just like a week or two. And so, anyway, it's been very humbling to go from years of talking with folks just in real life or on calls or whatever and most of them are kind of like i don't really get bitcoin i don't understand or whatever and all of a sudden there's people you know i get it's just amazing um you know the power of the internet the power of the global communications network um is the internet you know this would have been impossible 20 years ago and now you can be a nobody post something online and you all of a sudden meet so many wonderful people just like yourself that you know you make connections with and so anyway a little bit about me i've said this too um on the other podcast did a podcast with joe on block or solutions and then another podcast with um preston um on his on his show recently and so i won't go too much into my story because i did there um a lot more but basically i began my general investing journey about five six years ago 2016 2017 or so and I, you know, got into personal finance. I really got into stocks first and then real estate after that. And I did okay at both. Uh, I still am doing real estate. I'm, I'm almost entirely out of stocks now. I'm still doing real estate and actually I'm expanding into real estate a lot more. I'm uh, hopefully Lord willing, I'll become a, a real estate broker soon in the real estate near future, uh, doing really big deals with that. And then also buying a uh, multifamily uh, apartment complexes on on the side as I can, but uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, I first heard of it in 2017. Uh, like most people, like you and I were just talking before we started recording. Like most people, I thought it was a the way I put it is that I, I thought it was a scam at worst in which someone was going to steal my money, or at best a speculation that nobody really understands, nobody can predict, and something's really high risk because it's so volatile. So I'm just not going to pay attention to it. And of course, you know, most financial advisors, you know don't touch it with a 80,000 foot pole. So <laughs> um, all that I say, I, I didn't pay attention in 2017, 2018, uh, 2019. I started looking at it. I watched three or four documentaries on it. I still didn't quite understand it. And it took me an embarrassingly long time to really understand its implications, uh, you know, years. And um, yeah, and now here I am, it's early 2023. And I feel really frustrated, you know, when I meet people like you or, others that have just been in the space for years before me. It's really frustrating. But at the end of the day, you know, we're a very small group of people that understand the importance of this. We understand its inevitability and we understand how quickly it's going to change everything. And I'm just happy to be within the first half a percent, one percent of people that understand this. I feel like I've won the lottery, not just financially speaking, but from just an intellectual perspective it's like i have no idea how it's like you know god why on earth am i here in 2023 and i understand the you know monetary network of the millennia like how how do i understand it like like i'm not that smart i should not have understood this this early but somehow i did i maybe it's just my personality or i don't know but one way or another i'm here i get it or at least i think i understand it to the best of my ability and i'm just out there trying to give other people my perspective in hopes that they also come to see it. This is an uncomfortably high probability that um, Bitcoin is what we think it is. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Like, great intro. And just, just in your general circle, like say the real estate investment, is it just you or like, is there other guys around you that you've been kind of bouncing ideas off or have you came up this alone? Are you stand alone in your, amongst your peers? Oh yeah. Um, like you're asking are other people I work with in, into Bitcoin in that space. Right. Right. That's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> not yeah. at all. Um, 
I like, okay, earlier today I was talking to somebody that, you know, we were talking about their financial advisor and they said, Hey, watch your podcast. I talked to my financial advisor today, what they thought. My financial advisor was, no, <laughs> stay away. Uh, you know, so, you know, I talked to somebody earlier today and they didn't get it. And their financial advisor didn't get it, obviously. Um, just, let's see, Monday, we're recording this on Wednesday. On Monday, I had like a two, three hour meeting with a real estate guy. You know, he's got like $30, $40 million of real estate. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, it's not even on his radar. And I, I don't... I don't intend for this to come across arrogantly because what am I? I'm a 23 year old, nobody. Um, I don't have nearly the money other people do in the real estate world, but it's like, it's almost painful. It's like scratching fingers on a chalkboard. Cause this guy, or, or just, you know, the stereotype of, of this group, you know, a lot of folks in real estate, you know, 50, 60, 70 year olds, they have anywhere from 10 million to a hundred million dollars of, you know, single family, multifamily, you know, hundreds of houses, dozens of complexes, you know, whatever they have. And virtually none of them understand this. Um, it's not even on the radar. And they're like 80, 90% real estate and cash. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather have real estate than stocks. I'd definitely rather have stocks and bonds. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's almost painful because they don't understand how much of a threat Bitcoin is to their entire portfolio. And while yes, I think real estate has less downside than stocks and stocks have less downside than bonds. I it's with real estate. It's so liquid. It's really concerning. It's like you have a lot of real estate and you don't realize that you're going to have to unload a lot of it for Bitcoin and you're going to have to do it really quickly. And everyone else is going to be doing it at the same time you are. And so anyway, I'm kind of going on a tangent here. And, you know, perhaps I'm sounding a little too dramatic too early in the show here. But um, all I have to say is that, yeah, I work with a lot of people. Um, you know, m most of them are millionaires or multimillionaires or decamillionaires or whatever. And it's just, it's just, um, it's very frustrating to have a lot of people in my circle. And I know that unless they figure this out in the next five, 10 years or so, uh, you know, they're going to have a really hard time. And, um, yeah, they're, they're going to be fighting against an exponential trend that they don't even realize is coming for them. So anyway, all I have to say is that, yeah, the crossover is very, very small between Bitcoin and virtually every other industry. Stock people don't get it. Real estate people don't get it. Anyway. Yeah. But they will. <laughs> they will understand yeah, it eventually. Cool. So look, let's... Uh, you know, it, everyone's going to have to get there someday. Um, yeah. But to be honest, I can't, I can't actually wait till the next bull run comes around because like all the people that were, you know, screaming Ponzi and stuff, it's just going to be like, because it was so common last time around amongst established investors that they're just going to be caught, you know, red handed. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay. So just to, to break down your first part then, so we'll take the two thirds. We might, we might do a little bit more of a focus on the second one if you want, um, just because I don't think that's got as much airtime yet, but just to start the first one, um, like, yeah, it went really big all around technological, technological and societal evolution through time. And the fact that we, you're saying that we have less in common with the average person from the year 20, 21, 23, than with a Roman citizen from the year 23. What, yeah. How, how'd, you, how'd you even come up with that? Like was it, <laughs> this was on your mind for a while, was it? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely been on my mind. Um, I, the, the people that know me especially know that I love history so much and I love technology and the more I studied history, you know, even before coming to Bitcoin, the more I studied history, the more self-evident it became to me that it's like, not to oversimplify, but all of history is basically a direct function of technology. If you understand the technology of any given era, you can predict the politics, you can predict the wars, you can predict when there's going to be revolutions, you can predict, you know, frankly, even the religions, you can predict what people believe. It, it's really quite amazing. Um, and I talk about this on Preston's podcast too, but basically the turnover of empires and corporations and companies all comes down to technology. You know, it's just, if you can predict what technology is going to do and where it's going to go and how fast it's going to be, you can basically, you know, say everything else with the, with, with the society. Uh, so anyway, the, the basic idea with that we have less in common with the future than we do with the past, you know, which I know sounds really hard for people to understand today, but if we just take, you know, if we just step back 
and you know we go to any other period in history th this is true you know if if we were to travel back in time I, I go with this extensively in my first twitter thread about the year 1923 if we were to go back in time to the roaring 20s you know and you were to live there for a while i think it and then you go back in time to say the romans or the egyptians or you know the renaissance you know pick your pick your century it to me it becomes clear that folks from the 1920s have more in common with the people previous to them than to us today. And, and sure, that is more or less just an arbitrary claim. However, I genuinely believe it. And, and the, even though they had cars then, we have cars today, and they had cities today, we have cities today. Uh, the, the reason I, I think it's fundamentally true is because look at their daily lives. You know, the, most people in the 1920s, the work that they were doing was much more similar to the work of people a thousand years before than to us today. You know, to us today, the vast majority of people today, what do we do? We spend a lot of our day online. Uh, we have all sorts of banking and, you know, pretty much every facet of our social lives, our entertainment uh, lives, our work lives, our family lives, pretty much everything's drastically different uh, than it was uh, back then. You know, I mean, think about, just think about family life and family structure, you know, back in, from the 1920s to the, the, you know, ancient empires of thousands of years ago, you know, children basically more or less uh, were sources of income. You know, if you had chimney sweepers back in the early 20th century and, you know, even before that in the ancient empires, they were helping on the farm or, uh, you know, going to the market or whatever. And today, you know, that's not the case at all. You know, it's it's illegal to have your children work. And so, you know, from the time you're born till the time you're older, your entire life's different. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, you know, like the whole idea of retirement, this is an entirely new concept. You know, this didn't exist before because you just work till work till you die, <laughs> frankly, more or less, you know. So uh, this this whole idea of retirement, the whole idea of children uh, not being employed when, when they're really young or, or at least not helping the family earn an income, that, that's an entirely new idea. And, uh, the, the you know, the topics I especially care about that I go in extent it, extensively in detail in the thread or regarding poverty, you know, I, I got a lot of comments from people trying to understand what I was talking about that. How is it, can you say that the average person today is more prosperous than a billionaire a hundred years ago? That makes no sense. Whatever. And I, I understand why people have a hard time accepting that, but it's like, okay, you know, tuberculosis, we didn't have any treatment for tuberculosis until uh, what the forties, fifties. It's like, okay. Um, you know, malaria until relatively recently was an extremely high percentage of global death, you know, childbirth was a really big killer, you know, as technology improves, as society changes, the primary causes of death uh, shift and evolve along with technology. You know, today, what are our big killers, you know, especially here in the West, heart disease, cancer, uh, smoking, you know, all, all these, all these things that, you know, and, and I, I don't mean to demean these, uh, ailments and diseases, but the reality is these are diseases of the West. These are diseases of the privileged. We have transitioned from way back in the day when lions and bears were our biggest threat to then, you know, malaria or cholera or things like that. And then we've transitioned, you know, again, and again, and, you know, over the last hundred years, we've transitioned again to now where heart disease and diabetes and obesity are our biggest um, social threats. And these are all horrible things, but they're all a result of our technology. Our technology is better. We're living longer uh, lives. We have, you know, more food. I mean, today, for example, we have more, you know, obesity is a larger global problem than starvation. You know, it's, it's it, all that to say is that if you go to any other period in history and you look forward and back, the previous centuries seem ancient, the forward centuries seem mind-blowingly uh, progressive and the future in every iteration it has less in common with the present moment than the past does uh, with the present moment. And so the way I put it for people today is that if we're optimists and we assume that technology continues and that humanity continues to survive, the only logical conclusion, even before you come to Bitcoin, the only logical conclusion is that we inherently have to have less in common with the future uh, than we do with the past. And this is true with any, every exponential trend, you know, by definition, each iteration, you know, if you have, if every iteration doubles, you know, by definition, each iteration um, has just as much change as every other um, iter iteration previously. And so, you know, if we look forward and we have two iterations, it doesn't matter if we have a thousand iterations before us, the next two will have more of the exponential curve than everything we've experienced before. And so I, I don't, I, I do my best to not make specific claims with what the future is going to do. I know people make claims of, oh, you know, fission energy is going to 
be here in X number of years or AI robots will be here in Y number of years or whatever. And, and I, I try not to do that because I have no clue. But I do know that whatever technology becomes prevalent, whatever and however quickly it does, one way or another, our baseline assumption should be that we have less in common with the future than we do with the past. So that, that's the basic idea there. Even though it's extremely counterintuitive, it's the only logical conclusion I can come to. Do you think there's any scenario in, where we can go backwards? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I'm an optimist, but I'm also real. I mean, if we have a nuclear war, like that's that's to me a nuclear war or some EMP <laughs> or some other event that takes out the grid. Like it's like to me that's the most obvious thing. You know, if we have a, a major solar flare, which is actually an uncomfortably high possibility, if we wipe out the electric grid for a decade, it's like that that would be uh, that'd be catastrophic. Uh, or like I said, some sort of global war. Um, there, there are plenty of possibilities that go wrong. You know, like one of Elon Musk's main concerns is, I think, legitimate of that of a rogue AI. I think that's true. Um, you know, th there's, there's plenty of concerns. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern with climate change and general pollution. I think that's uh, a significantly lower risk than, say, nuclear war or an EMP or solar flare, or, you know, CMP or something. Um, but, you know, still, there are a lot of risks. And again, with technology, if we assume there's more change in the future than in the past, that probably means whatever threats we have today, there will just be more threats in the future and they'll be larger than we expect. They'll be different than we expect. You know, I mean, it's like, it's the same idea of if you go back to 1923, the whole premise of nuclear war would be a foreign concept. And yet today, even though life is objectively better and more prosperous, we have new threats that are greater than every threat we've had previously. And so, you know, to answer your question of, could this optimistic scenario not play out? Yeah, easily. And unfortunately, there are a lot of negative things can happen. And probably the worst case scenarios are scenarios that we don't even know how to predict yet because they're yet to manifest. But I'm an optimist. I think we will um, overcome them. And even if they do occur, one of the points that Joe made on his podcast that I really loved was that the 20th century had so much change, and yet we had multiple devastating global events. You know, World War One, World War Two. Uh, the rise of communism, you, you had the Great Depression. I mean, you like uh, the whole 20th century was full of war and destruction that is just, I mean, the Spanish flu too. I mean, there, there's so many horrible global crises that happened in the 20th century, and yet we had immense changes. So even if we have some sort of World War Three or global catastrophe today, I, I don't think humanity ends. And even if it slows progress. And I actually go into this in my thread too. I have two scenarios um, mapped out on my global progression of human energy consumption of what if you have a disaster or a complete apocalypse. And I mean, my view is that, yeah, something really bad could happen, but even if something really bad happens, all you do is you slow the momentum. I, I think, I, I don't think we can stop it. As long as humanity continues in this current age, I don't think we're going to stop. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And I obviously agree with you, but just to game it out, like I was thinking something maybe more structural that could lead those kind of events on. So like, I'm just thinking, I know it's a really good point that you made um, regarding like, look at all the, you know, the terrors of like the 20, World War II, World War One, all that kind of stuff, like really bad. Like if you were in 1900 looking forward at that, you, I don't think if you were told that all those people are going to die, that was going to happen. You would have, expected society to be so prosperous a hundred years later. So it's a good point. Just to be devil's advocate on it, like, and let's say Bitcoin doesn't exist. So Bitcoin plays no part in this at the moment, which obviously yeah, yeah. We're, is going to change We're not a lot even talking things. about that yet. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> just say US dollar creeps into like, you know, uh, global hyperinflation. Uh, US dollar starts to go into hyperinflation, which causes a global financial meltdown and then brings on all this other stuff. Um, I suppose it doesn't really change anything on what you just said, does it? No, no, I don't think it does. Um, so it's, it's, even it's if the total have... doomer, total doomer outlook. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Sorry, a little I... bit of a lag. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, we're very far apart. It's a little bit of a lag. Uh, but yeah, I, I, think, I think the Hollywood idea of a global complete doomsday where it's just you know, kind of like a Mad Max or a post-apocalyptic world where there's like 100,000 people living in a uh, radioactive desert with 
robot, alien, zombies, whatever. I, I think that's totally fiction. It, it is, you know, especially, especially the nuclear um, war concept. I, I think people dramatically have an incorrect view of what a nuclear war uh, would look like. You know, I, I think, I think people overestimate the destruction of nuclear war by like a factor of 10. Uh, and that's not to say it's not, it wouldn't be horrible. It would be absolutely horrible, far worse than World War II. But it's like, it, it would be really hard to kill 80, 90% of humanity. You know, it's like, even if we had some horrible thing, it's like it, the, the idea of the human population going below one or 2 billion again, it's like, I, I have no idea how that could happen. Like, I can't think of anything. And like I said earlier, perhaps in the future, we have an even worse um, series of potential catas catastrophes ahead of us. But I mean, it, it, it just seems that even in the worst case scenarios we can imagine today, you know, if, if you look at the data and you look at the studies that I, I have, it just seems tremendously difficult uh, to kill that many people. Cause you know, we're, we're living organisms like everything else on earth and we adapt, we fight, uh, we have technology to help us adapt and fight. And, you know, even if you give a, even if you oppress us and force us down with massive resistance, the, the idea of completely crushing us just seems um, extraordinarily difficult. And I used to be a lot more pessimistic on this than I am now. I, I used to think that there were so many ways the world could completely end and humanity's wipe off the face of the earth. But to me, it, it, it just, it, the more I look at it, the less likely it seems. So just as it, like one of the main tenets of your, your first period is the idea of like deflation forever um, as kind of like what perfect money does to everything else. Do, do you want to just break that down? It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. So going off the assumption we've established that the future, we have less to come with the future than the past. And that even if we have some sort of horrible event, humanity is going to continue and eventually, you know, technology will just continue to progress. The, the basic the basic reality here is that you realize okay technology for thousands of years all it has done is force prices down uh, continuously you know I, I'm sitting in a house right now uh, with heat and light and everything else and you know you know the the amount of prosperity one can purchase with a given amount of labor and a given amount of effort um, has continued to become more and more affordable uh, forever. You know, a, a Roman objectively is m more prosperous than an Egyptian, and a Roman was less prosperous than, you know, say, someone of one of the uh, ancient Chinese civilizations after uh, Rome, and someone of that era was less prosperous than one of the European empires of the, you know, of the discovery of the new world. And everyone of that era, you know, continuously, everyone of the future world is more prosperous than the previous world. And, and the way to define that is deflation. The brute force physical cost it takes to acquire wealth and prosperity is continuing to go down forever. You know, I mean, take take our, you know, cellular devices here. Uh, you know, what is this? Well, this is like a, a thousand tools in one. You know, last night I downloaded a new app of, um, you know, something that would have probably cost me 50 bucks if I bought it in a store. And I downloaded it for free instantly in a matter of minutes. You know, this, this is deflation. You know, your, your smartphone is deflation because it, it is the cost of getting the cost of getting things done just continues to go down as technology progresses. And it, Jeff Booth puts it really well. I, I'm going to not get the quote right, I think, but he says that things trend towards information and information trends to free. So basically the idea being that we can replace things and products with digital and digital versions of that. And, you know, the digital you know, nature of technology and uh, Moore's law and everything has information trend towards free as we have more and more computing power. And so what does deflation forever going forward mean? Well, it means that, again, if we're optimists and we assume humanity is going to survive and we assume technology is just going to continue and that there's no limit to how well, to how much technology could do, more or less, at least on human terms, then the only logical conclusion is that the real cost of a house, the real cost of food, the real cost of, you know, tools will only continue to become cheaper and cheaper and more prosperous. And to me, that's a completely self-evident truth. That's what we've experienced for thousands of years. And to me, that seems obvious that into the future, as technology gets better, everything will just get cheaper, which is deflation. And interestingly, like, do you, so obviously the current trend, so while, it, while that's true as a whole, um, you're going to have a lot of people push back on that with talking about housing, you know, real estate, all that kind of stuff. Do, 
excluding Bitcoin, do you think this would come down over time if Bitcoin wasn't there, or would that just keep serving as your your quote unquote, you know, your money or your perfect money as as you lose in the thread? Yeah, well, it, it depends on your frame of reference. You know, I'm talking in real terms here. In real terms, house prices have done nothing but go down. If you look from the uh, frame of political currency units, you see the opposite. You see house prices going up. You know, my my, my grandmother just sold her house for 10 times what she bought it for. It's like the house is the same. In fact, the house is probably in worse condition today than it was then. And <laughs> why is it 10 times more expensive? When technology's gotten 10 times better, say, or three times better. Well, it's, it's because if you denominate said house in terms of political currency units and, you know, fixed income debt instruments, there's an endless amount of those. And so you just have an exponentially increasing supply of those that you're denominating that house in. Well, of course, it's obvious that the price of the house in those terms is going to go up continuously. Now, if you price that house in terms of oil, barrels of oil, you know, maybe the price would be very different. If you price that house in terms of bars of gold, then that's different. If you priced it in terms of uh, wages and number of hours of labor it would take to buy the house, it's definitely going to be different. So it, it's all about your frame of reference. Looking forward, will the price of X increase? It's like, well, what, what's your what's the money or the asset you're using to price that within? You know. So it, it's all about frame of reference, and that's why people yeah. have such yeah. It's what's all about. Yeah, sorry, lag again, <laughs> but um, yeah. So okay, so with regards to your talk about real terms, um, what kind of terms your yeah your frame of reference with Bitcoin? Now Bitcoin fits nicely into all this because it kind of makes everything into real terms. Do you want to just explain that? Like, so, so you're saying that Bitcoin, so you have stocks, bonds, etc. I just just going to get a quote from your article. But my stocks, my bonds, my cash, zero, 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 much faster than you think. Do you want to explain why you believe that's the case? Yeah, I got a lot of feedback on that and some very interesting comments. If you want to, if, if someone re, if someone watching this wants to read those, a lot of interesting discussion there. But yeah, what he's referring to is basically I have a, I have a few given charts up where I price things in terms of Bitcoin. And what you see is that on every chart, the lines going down, you know, see what most people do is they look at Bitcoin through the lens of their political currency unit of choice. And they see this thing that's going up and up and up extremely quickly. And they think, oh my goodness, that's a bubble. That's such high risk. I don't know why people are buying it. Oh, they're gambling everything away. And to, to their credit, that makes sense because in their mindset, and they've had for their entire lives and their parents' lives and their grandparents' lives, and you know, for thousands of years going back and back and back, the way you price everything in the world is in your given political currency unit of, of your era. You view, you know, that, uh, I don't have any cash in me, but you view a dollar bill as your measure of value, as your standard uh, value. Going back again to the house, you know, you price that house in terms of US dollars and you think the value of that house is going up because you're pricing it in terms of those dollars. Well, what Bitcoin exposes is, is that it is the first immutable fixed closed monetary network in the history of humanity. And so what it exposes is the paradox in that assumption. You know, again, the house is not going up in price by a factor of 10. It's real brute force physical cost is going down. It's that the conversion rate, the exchange rate into USD political currency units is going up because the United States dollar is a more open system. Its supply is more easily expanded than, say, the total inventory of the housing market. And so what, what Bitcoin exposes is it, is it exposes the lack of, frankly, logic in, in that worldview. And it says, no, this, there's a fixed system here, a fixed number of monetary units in this energy network. And because it's fixed and everything else is not fixed, the only logical conclusion here, and this is what Hal Finney predicted back in 2009, and I go into that in my uh, second thread, it's just why he was a genius, and how for the last 14 years he's only been proven correct, it, is that because this is closed network and we're pricing all these open networks in terms of it, their exchange rates have to continue down forever. You know, I've given the uh, example on Preston and Joe's podcast about comparing oxygen versus the Mona Lisa, and I think it's worthy saying here too. It doesn't matter how valuable the oxygen is to your life and your survival, if you have a closed system where there's only one, like the Mona Lisa, 
the exchange rate has to go down to zero in, in uh, the oxygen um, has to go down to zero in relation to Mona Lisa because it's all about perspective. And so, and so w when it comes to Bitcoin, what do I mean, you know, with, with the quote you gave of zero, 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 turning towards zero forever? Well, what, what people fail to realize is that Bitcoin is not increasing. You know, we, we look at it from our current worldview and we think it's increasing and skyrocketing. And it's like, yes, that's true from your view, but look from the other direction. You know, from the other direction, you don't see Bitcoin as a bubble that's expanding, expanding. You see everything else as a bubble that's deflating. You know, when it's, you know, say the US dollar, you know, just invert the chart. You clearly don't see Bitcoin going up in a volatile fashion. You see the dollar decreasing in a volatile fashion. And it's like, oh, that's just a bunch of semantics or whatever. But, you know, it, it's really not. It, both, both views are equally as valid. In terms of the USD, Bitcoin is increasing at a volatile rate. And in terms of BTC, the US dollar is decreasing at a volatile rate. And this has been happening for 14 years now. And so the only question is, okay, if both of these views are equally valid, which one fundamentally is more correct? And in order to do that, you have to look at the fundamental supply, the measuring stick within that system. And when you look at that fundamental view, Bitcoin is clearly the view uh, that is more accurate because it's an unchanging uh, closed system. You know, it is, yeah. So, so basically what does it mean that everything else is trending to zero? Well, what it means is everything else is an open system and it's only going to become more open. There is no limit to how many houses we can produce. There's no limit to how many stories we can put in those houses, more or less. There, there's no limit to how much land we can use or how efficiently we can use that land. There, there's more or less an infinite number of houses available. And likewise, obviously, there's an infinite amount of cash. You know, as the famous quote says, there's an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> there's an infinite amount of debt the United States can borrow. Just yesterday, the Treasury came out and said that the... Um, Debt held by the public is going to be like 700% of GDP by the late 21st century. And it's like, it, it's absurd. There's an endless amount of debt we can produce. And therefore, there's an endless amount of bonds that we can dump onto the market. An endless number of political currency units. And, you know, take stocks. Yeah, sure, they're regulated. And they're more, they're, they're a less open system than, say, cash. But the reality is there's an endless number of companies that could be made. And an endless amount of stock that those companies can issue. And there's an endless amount of brands, an endless amount, you know, th there's an infinite amount of all these uh, commodities and securities and paper assets and fixed income assets. It, there's an endless amount of promises. There's an endless amount of all the stuff that we have, except, except Bitcoin. That's the only thing that we can't make more of, even if we tried, you know. So anyway, that, that's, that's what that means, basically. That if you have something where there's a finite amount and everything else is an infinite amount. The, the reality is that everything with an infinite supply inherently has to have its exchange rate decline in relative value against the one thing with, with a finite supply. Everything is oxygen and nitrogen and helium and, and, and gold and silver and aluminum compared to the Mona Lisa. And in terms of Mona Lisa, everything else continues to go down forever. And I encourage you to look at my thread, and I have a lot more threads coming up where I really dive into this, and it's just devastating uh, for every asset that's not Bitcoin. It, their, the future is extremely um, bleak. Stocks, bonds, real estate, cash, art, silver, gold, I, I don't care. Whatever it is, it's only going down against Bitcoin th theoretically forever. And it's already been going down for 14 years and it's only going to get faster. So, yep. <laughs> so, okay. The, the, yeah, good answer. Um, so, just on that, it's like, is that binary? So like what I, I, I totally get the point that Bitcoin as a whole, like if the Bitcoin thesis is correct, there's going to be no better investment anywhere <laughs> than Bitcoin um, for at least the next, you know, five to 10 years, say, say 10 or 15 years out from now. And you Bitcoin now is the currency of the world, it's the money of the world. And it's, it's not really, um, yeah, it's, it's the currency of the world and there isn't that appreciate, there's that steady appreciation of value as more economic value is captured into it over time, but it's nothing dramatic. Is it still, like in your opinion, is it still binary that all, that as a rule, all, like as I say, as a binary rule for each individual stock going, trending to zero against Bitcoin over time, or would it be more like the, say the market cap of the whole stock market 
will trend towards zero, but you could have individual, like for example, if hypothetically Amazon was still around, around and they were producing a lot of value to people that they could actually outperform the deflation um, over an extended period of time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're basically asking, is, that, is what I'm saying true forever or is that just true for the next 10, 15 years, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, I know this might be controversial and really hard to accept, especially for the people listening that um, have not given this Bitcoin thing, uh, you know, 100 or 1,000 hours of thought. But what I would say is this. I, I used to think that, you know, I used to think that stocks would go up forever. I, I used to, you know, just be like you. And my warning is that I used to be like you, and now I'm saying these things, and I, <laughs> it's 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 been a lot of thought um, into this. And what I would say to answer your question is that yeah, I genuinely think that as long as Bitcoin continues to survive, stocks, bonds, cash, everything continues towards zero exponentially forever. And the farther you go out, the more dramatic it becomes. You know, I think the idea that stocks and bonds or whatever will go down, will go down against Bitcoin for the next 15 years. And you're like, no, no, like I mean forever. Most people, when they make a prediction like, oh, gold's, you should buy gold or silver. It's going to do really well. You should buy real, you know, they're thinking in a time horizon of 10, 15, 20 years. I'm talking about the next thousand years. Bitcoin may not survive a thousand years, but that's irrelevant. I'm talking about as far into the future that we can possibly imagine. I see no other scenario in which any other asset was appreciates against Bitcoin continually for an extended period of time. I don't think it's possible. Why? Well, you alluded, first of all, to the idea of Amazon's around in the future. Like, I mean, sorry to burst the average person's bubble, but Amazon probably won't survive another century. You know, every conglomerate or corporation or tech giant of the last, you know, 5,000 years eventually became outdated. And again, why is that? It all comes back to technology. Eventually Amazon will get so big and so bloated and so profitable that they don't, uh, they don't innovate. They don't, you know, reinvest properly or mismanagement or whatever it is. And eventually some competitor with a great enough incentive will begin to take away market share from Amazon. And, you know, so eventually every company in the stock market today, it's going to roll over into some new tech conglomerate and tech monopoly. So that's the first thing that should be said. But why fundamentally do I think that the stock market as a whole will go down? Well, the reason for that is because in the future world, if we assume that the world continues, the the <laughs> the problem is that margins get squeezed tighter and tighter. As the globe becomes, uh, it ha has a higher and faster rate of communication, as the market becomes only more efficient, just, you know, technically speaking, margins have to continue uh, to decline. And so, you know, in the future, why on earth would you hold a piece of paper share promise equity within a given jurisdiction of a local government? And we know governments don't keep their promises. We know CEOs don't keep their promises. You know, why would you hold a paper intangible security of a corporation where you have to rely on their cash flows and their CEO not being caught up in some sort of, you know, money laundering thing? And, you know, basically you are buying a promise, a piece of paper of equity in a company that has counterparty risk. And sure, you might make money. That company might not perform, you know, the deflate the uh, deflationary money stock of the world, which I'm arguing is Bitcoin. It, it might do well for a while, sure. Uh, I mean, you know, definitely the last year is an example of how many stocks have not crashed 60, 70% like Bitcoin has. <laughs> However, it should be noted a lot of stocks have done worse, actually. You know, take Netflix or Facebook, for example. I mean, it's already happening. Stocks are down farther to Bitcoin in the last year. And they went up less than Bitcoin did in 2020 and 2021. And you have counterparty risk with those and you don't have with Bitcoin. And this is the terrifying thing for me. I think in the next five or 10 years, people will realize, even if they don't fully agree with what I'm saying, they'll realize that it's a possibility. And once you realize that's a possibility, you have to protect yourself. And the only way to protect yourself is to buy Bitcoin. But why do I think it will go down forever? Well, it's because no matter, it's no, no matter how well the company does, the company can bring value to the world. It can do wonderful things. But I, as the world gets better and more and more demand goes in, into that global monetary stock and the risk of that monetary stock continues to decrease forever and the inherent risk in owning a stock stays flat, and I would argue goes up as technology comes faster, there is a greater and greater financial incentive to just own that money and less and less financial incentive to speculate and gamble in the stock market. I mean, you know, just to go back to what I was saying earlier, it's like 
I mean, like step out of your 2023 shoes and skip forward a century and then look backwards to today. It's like, what does the average person do? The average person gambles, speculates in the, the global stock securities market and the global fixed income sovereign debt market. It's like, okay, half the companies on the market don't keep up with the market. And they go bankrupt all the time. It's like, there's so much risk in the stock market and, and the bond market, you know, maybe year to year has less risk, but I mean, on, on a longer time frame, it has a higher risk because companies or excuse me, countries are basically large corporations that are insolvent. You know, the United States is basically a large corporation that's insolvent. And the only reason it hasn't gone bankrupt like a company is because, you know, they, they have a monopoly on their customers, on their taxpayers. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, Again, go to the future and look backwards in time. It's like, what does the average person do today to save purchasing power for the retirement? They gamble in these equity security markets and they gamble in these sovereign debt markets of countries they know to be insolvent. Everyone jokes that they're insolvent. And it's like, we put all of our purchasing power, all of our labor and our, our capital gains into these things and diversify them in all these open systems and hope that the aggregate slow demise of these systems is slower than the aggregate slow demise of the political currency unit that we measure that diversified portfolio in. It, it, it's complete madness. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's completely insane. You know, and, and like I was explaining to someone uh, recently, it, it's like, it's like being a horse breeder, trying to breed the perfect horse. It's like, that's what you do when you have a diversified portfolio, you, okay, if we have this percentage of bonds and this percentage of stocks and this percentage of commodities and cash and whatever, it's so much work. You have to pay somebody 2% every year of manage the darn thing. And then you have to time when you get in and time when you get out. And man, it's like, it's, <laughs> it, it's so much work. It's so much effort. And it's so complicated. And all you're trying to do is make the perfect money. If we follow this equation of diversification, then we can get a perfect conglomerate that basically acts as money that continues to hold and hopefully increase its uh, purchasing power as a function of time. And what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is that. It is what that diversified portfolio is trying to do, but except better, infinitely better because it's a closed system and because it absorbs productivity gains and because it uh, doesn't have the openness to that system where there's an increasing supply. You know, Bitcoin does exactly what a diversified portfolio is going to be. And so the, the funny thing is today, people ask me all the time, how should I put Bitcoin in my diversified portfolio and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, I mean, it's, it's good. They're curious, but it's so frustrating because it's like you fail to realize Bitcoin is not a, a percent, given percentage of an allocation in your portfolio so that you can, you know, make your best compound and blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, no, no. Bitcoin is what makes that entire idea irrelevant. It's like saying, how do I, you know, oh, this locomotive thing's cool. How do I, how do I put a steam engine in my horse? It's like, <laughs> it like, it's, you know, people ask that question and they're genuinely curious, but they don't realize how nonsensical it is. It's like, no, 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 this isn't a, this isn't something you incorporate into your worldview. This is a completely different worldview. And they inherently only one can survive. Maybe, maybe we're wrong about Bitcoin. Maybe it dies and the world continues as it has for thousands of years. But if you assume there's any probability that Bitcoin survives, you are inherently assuming a probability that your entire understanding of diversification and portfolio between all these open systems inherently has to go away. You, you know, again, to use the metaphor of the locomotive, it's like to think the locomotive has any chance of success and survival and um, economic need in the future you have to assume that the horse population per capita is going to collapse and that it's just not sustainable. And in, in the same way, I'm afraid people are starting to realize that all their models are breaking. Nothing makes any sense. There's more and more speculation. There's more and more financialization of every part of the economy. And people feel that, you know, things don't make sense and they can't put their finger on it. And as I started out saying, everything comes down to technology. We have a new technology that makes this, all of our models and all of our understanding, you know, all of our thousands of years of breeding horses, it's like, it makes it completely irrelevant and people don't realize that yet. And anyway, I'm, I'm kind of going on here, but that, that that's the basic distinction I would make that, you know, learn about Bitcoin. I'd encourage you to think of it first and foremost, not as a financial product you put in your current portfolio, but as a piece of technology. And once you realize this piece of technology does what it's designed to do successfully, then it becomes self-evident what to do. 
So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're kind of somewhere along the way. We've now morphed into the second third. <laughs> so this great. Um, but I just want to just pull it back a tiny bit. So just sure. to, like just perfect money. Like, well, what what are you what are you defining as um, perfect money? Like, I know you're talking about closed mon closed monetary system now. This it's kind of interesting. I, I get the premise, but if you just want to explain around it a little bit, because often you hear people refer to Bitcoin as an open monetary system in terms of it being permissionless. I, I don't think that's what you're yes. alluding to here, but yeah. do you want to just explain perfect money in the closed system just to uh, give the clarification on it? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because people do often refer to it as an open monetary system. And, and people refer to it open as an open in permission. You don't need permission to join it. You know, it's not a closed elitist group that, oh, you have to be like, you know, take the United States, for example, you have to be a U.S. citizen or, you know, have an exchange rate, you know, like you have to have more or less permission with the United States government to, to exchange um, with them, even if you're in a foreign country or, or something to that extent. But when it comes to Bitcoin, it's open in that anyone can use it freely and nobody can censor you or, or stop you or whatever. And as CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, become more popular, the closedness or, or the lack of um, freedom in these fiat currencies is just going to become more apparent. Uh, that that was the case is the case in Nigeria uh, right now, unfortunately, uh, along with other developing nations. Um, but regar regarding to my comments of it being a closed system, when I refer to it as a closed system, I'm not talking in terms of accessibility. I'm talking in terms of engineering. Um, and this is why engineers understand Bitcoin much quicker than finance people is because engineers understand an open and closed system. You know, a, a plane that flies is a closed system. A plane that has a hole in, you know, the, the side of it, you know, that it's eventually going to crash. That's an open system. If you have a satellite in, in orbit uh, around the earth, that's a closed system uh, because there's no energy loss. But if you, you know, it's continuously falling towards earth, and it just stays in orbit. It, it's rate of decay is zero, you know, zero, perfect, closed. But if you have a satellite, that eventually is, you know, every, uh, yeah, every time it goes around the earth, it becomes closer and closer to the ground and eventually crashes and burns in the atmosphere or, or hit or um, hits earth or whatever, you know, that would be an open system because there's an energy leak. And every time it goes around, it's losing energy and it's decaying eventually back to crash down uh, to the ground. So th those that's an open or closed system. Or one of my favorite metaphors is that of a ship. You know, if you're in the middle of the ocean and you have a ship, you know, and there's a hole in the hole and water's coming on, that's an open system because you have energy, you have water that's coming in and weighing the ship down. And, and, you know, open systems have an exponential rate of decay. As more water comes into the ship, it sinks a little faster. As it sinks faster, more water comes in. There's greater water pressure forcing water in. Uh, you, you know, and there's less buoyancy. It's like every component of the rate of a ship sinking gets faster and faster, more exponential as the open system becomes more and more open and it tears open the hole in that hole versus a ship that floats. That's a closed system. And the value of a closed system in terms of an open system is infinity. A ship that floats is not worth 10% more than a ship that doesn't float. It's worth infinitely more. <laughs> than a ship that doesn't float. It, it, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's so obvious to when you put it that way. And so what is a perfect money? Why is Bitcoin perfect money? Why is it a closed system? It, it, well, it's because every unit within Bitcoin's network has only been created as a result of a brute force physical cost that has been exerted in some manner or some fashion. If I buy Bitcoin today, uh, you know, say I buy a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. I, it took effort. It took a brute force physical cost uh, to acquire that capital. That that's economic energy. That thousand USD, even though the USD itself is corrupted, the the energy it took to acquire is legitimate. It either took labor or it took intellect or it took some sort of brute force physical cost to acquire that purchasing power. And when that's converted into Bitcoin, well, that you know that Bitcoin has that cost. And you know. What do miners do? Well, what miners do is they expend enormous amounts of electricity, enormous amounts of computing power, again, a brute force physical cost, to create new new Bitcoin. No Bitcoin is created out of thin air. It is either created um, through miners, it, well, actually, all of it is created through miners, and then it's transacted uh, between parties. Now, compare that to the US dollar or another political currency unit that uses an abstract power hierarchy. What happens there? Well, you have Ben Bernanke or Jerome Powell or Yellen or somebody, uh, Congress, <laughs> say, okay, we need more currency units, so let's make them. 
okay, just sign it. And yeah, sure, it, you know, takes energy to put the ink on a, on the on the paper, but there's no limit to how many zeros you can just add to it. Like, it's just you need you need more currency units. Okay, add another zero, and add another zero, and another. And so there's no there's no cost there, there's no cost there's no effort there's no um, you know it, it's it's a violation of the law of conservation of energy. All these ledgers of these political currency units are more or less breaking the laws of physics because you're creating value out of thin air. Or one of Elon Musk's best quotes uh, regarding the lockdown: "If you make no stuff, there is no stuff." <laughs> You know, it's, it doesn't matter if you print money, uh, you know, if, if you create money out of thin air and then you exchange it for goods in the real world and there was no cost in creating that money, it's like it's an inherently a corrupted ledger and that has to collapse. FTX is one of those examples. What did Sam Bakeman Free do? He created FTT token out of thin air and exchange it for, you know, U.S. dollars or Bitcoin or, you know, whatever, you know, things with real brute force fiscal cost and his made up token FTT and a made up exchange FTX where basic their ledgers are basically again violating physics and it was a matter of time again using the satellite metaphor it was a matter of time until the market corrected and it crashed back to earth you know at, at an exponential rate you know the FTT token declined a little bit a little bit a little bit and then boom it was over and so Anyway, why why is Bitcoin better? Well, Bitcoin's better because it's a closed system, because it, it it obeys the law of conservation of energy, and it inherently takes uh, capital energy or electronic energy or informational energy or some sort of cost to create. It, it, every unit of Bitcoin in existence it is perfectly legitimate. It's perfectly verifiably uh, scarce, and it's immutable in in nature. Nobody can change it. So why why is it perfect money? It's like well. Because, because as strange as it sounds, it obeys physics, it obeys math. And we've never had a currency system that has done that before. Gold has been the closest thing. With gold, it takes a brute force physical cost to mine it out of the ground or to create it. You can't just manifest gold. Uh, but the problem with gold is that there's an infinite amount of it. You know, we can mine more gold. You know, Uganda just had, I think it was 30 million tons of ore of gold discovered last year or, or um, yeah, I believe it was last year and there's gold in space, there's gold in the oceans, there's, you know, and as technology gets better, the, the amount, the, the exertion of energy will be the same, but, but the cost and the expense of the energy as a percent of global energy production will become smaller and smaller. And so therefore you will only be able to produce more gold. So, so why is Bitcoin perfect money? Well, it's a closed system. Number one, in the fact that it takes energy to produce. And number two, that there's only a fixed number. You know, you can't make more. Just because technology gets better and better and the cost of electricity goes down continuously forever, it, you, the rate of supply of, the, 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 the number of Bitcoins in existence do not increase along with that, you know, versus gold, versus houses and everything else. The number of houses, the number of bars of gold have to increase as energy continues to increase in abundance. And Bitcoin is an algorithm uh, that fights that, that resists that. And, that, and that's, that's what Henry Ford and Tesla and, and other folks, again, engineers, um, understood, you know, <laughs> engineers of, of 100 years ago, 120 years ago, understood Bitcoin and finance experts and bankers today don't understand it. It's just, um, anyway, I'll say that's what I mean by a closed system. It's a, it's a, it's fundamentally a piece of code, an algorithm, so to speak, that is just math. It's just math, and it's not made up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I totally understand. Yeah, no, I don't have a background in physics, so that's uh, a great clarification. Um, but so what you're saying there with regards, say, the USD versus Bitcoin, so to use your satellite spinning towards the Earth, the open system example, like, do you think then... Like, how soon do you think this is going to happen? Like, uh, look, I know um might be like, how long is a piece of string? Who knows? But that satellite is is, hur is hurtling now. Um, in I assume in your opinion, well, obviously based on the threads, like, does do you think like next, say like Bitcoin goes on a mad bull run next cycle and hops up to 200K or something like that? Is that then like the shelling point where there's no return? Like, do you think 
the US dollar just bleeds away after that at an exponential like is it just like as you say the bang the clap and yeah. then everyone that doesn't have bitcoins left without a chair is, is that what you, is that what you think yeah what i'm about to say is going to be really offensive to people especially again for those that are new to bitcoin don't understand it yet uh, but i just please hear me out and if you disagree put it in the comments why i'm wrong please <laughs> and somebody will debate you or i, I don't know you, you can just you know, be angry at me or whatever. Uh, but what I would say is this, even if Bitcoin didn't exist, we all know the dollar's going to zero. You know, I get told all the time, stop buying Bitcoin, just buy real estate. And I ask why, and they say, cause real estate only goes up. <laughs> it's what I've been saying this whole time. It's like, no, the real estate's not going up. You're not saying, you're not really saying real estate goes up forever. You're saying, the price or the exchange rate of, of real estate goes down, the, the, the USD conversion rate goes down forever. That's what you're really saying. Oh, just buy and hold stocks forever. You'll retire just fine. It's like, no, you're not saying this. That's not what you're really saying. That's what you think you're saying, but it's not what you're saying. So we all know because we believe that stocks go up forever and because you believe that real estate goes up forever, you know, and they're solid long-term investments. It's like, no, we're not really saying that these things go up in value forever because we know technology makes them more affordable as a function of time. What we're really saying is that we know the exchange rate in terms of US dollar is continuing um, to go in the direction it's been going forever. And so we all inherently know that the dollar is going to continue to decline in real purchasing power as a function of time. We already know this. It's just what I'm saying is that it's going to happen faster than you think. That's what I'm saying. And the reason I'm saying that is because this is Fundamentally, every currency, what is it? It's an energy network. And it's an energy network with an open system. There's, there's a hole in the hole of this ship. And every energy network has to decline at an exponential rate. Like I said, a ship does not sink in a linear path. A, a satellite does not crash down to orbit in a linear path. FTX, and again, an open system of economic energy within the, um, F, 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 the FTT tokens, the open system on, on the FTX platform. It declined in exponential fashion. It went down and down and down faster and down faster. And then for like three days, it was like everyone was talking about it online because it was like going out really fast. And then boom, instantly went to zero. So what's my guess for the US dollar? Well, I think even before we talk about Bitcoin, before we talk about time, like we have to say that one way or another, the dollar is going to continue to decline in value. And our base case expectation should be it should decline at an exponential rate. Now, since we are talking about Bitcoin, since, you know, we are putting it on a timeline here, what do I think? Well, I think it's going to be significantly sooner than people expect because people are looking at the decline in the value of the U.S. dollar today and they're thinking in linear terms because that's what human brains are best at thinking. And, and we fail to realize the exponential nature of this. And my fear is that we are far, we are much farther along than people realize Um you know, basically, for most people don't know this, and it's just terrifying to think about. But the when the world was freaking about about ventilators and viruses and um, all the controversy with the lockdown in March of 2020, what did the Federal Reserve do? The Federal Reserve re reserve requirements for all depository institutions in the United States to zero percent, not one percent, not ten percent, zero percent. Now, what the heck does that mean? It means that legally speaking, according to the Central Bank of the United States of America, your bank account is allowed to have zero reserves back in it. That's not to say it, it does. That's not to say it's a guarantee, but it's to say it's allowed. Okay, you walk into your bank account, you feel safe and secure because you see that little FDIC logo, the little emblem and the big letters, and I'm secured up to 250 grand, right? Sure, you're secured up to it. Sure, you'll get your currency units back. But it's like nobody questions it. You know, I mean, before I started learning, I didn't even question it. Oh, FDIC, yeah, that's that's solvent. That's sure. It's the U.S. government. You, you know, they never go broke. Well, you know, besides the two central banks before the Federal Reserve, besides the two times that they that they made gold illegal and confiscated all the gold, and besides the two hyperinflationary events we had in the United States, besides those, they never go broke. The United States never goes broke. And the FDIC must be secure then. Well... By the FDIC's own admission and their own balance sheet, they have a reserve ratio of 1.26%. They are ensuring 
$9,900 billion of bank accounts with 100 billion, 120, you know, 122, $126 billion of assets. They make FTX look like a freaking child. It, it's, it's ridiculous. Everyone, I got so many comments. Oh, I hope you sold all your Bitcoin. The FTX is a disaster. It's like, no. Okay, first of all, I don't lose a single dollar in the FTX scam because I could see it was a scam because it's an open system. It's like what Bitcoin fixes. Okay, but number two, that was a $32 billion Ponzi scheme, FTX was. Okay, the FDIC is insuring $9,900 billion. This thing is like 300 times larger than FTX. And so, you know, you ask me, you know, what's this going to look like? How far it is? It's like people don't think about this. And yet it's self-evident. The dollar has to decline, number one. It's self-evident. Number two, that because it's an engineering system, just like every other system, all the examples we gave earlier, it has to decline in an exponential rate. And number three, by the U.S. government's own admission, your bank account might have 0% reserves and the insurance for that you know, 99% of that doesn't really exist. We have no backing for it. And then, oh, I'm so glad, you know, I don't, I didn't buy Bitcoin. What a scam. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's extreme. I'm sorry I'm getting a little <laughs> emotional here, but, you know, people think, oh, yeah, maybe in the future the dollar is going to go away. It's like, no disrespect, but uh, if you don't know this, you, it, it, you are at extremely high risk. You have all this money in your bank. You know, the, the way I put it to people, to be completely frank, is that, you know, if you own bonds or stock or not stocks, sorry, stocks are different. If you own bonds or political currency units or you have a bank account, I mean, frankly, you might as well as count is already gone because by the government's own admission, it might already be gone. <laughs> now, you might get the same number of currency units back. But what happens when that 1.26% reserve ratio of the FDIC goes away? You, you print the rest. Sure, you might get you know, FDIC insurance is up to 250 grand. It's like, yeah, you might get 250 grand back, but it might be entirely printed or at least 99% of it along with everyone else that's claiming, you know? So anyway, all that to say is, you know, I, I don't like to make short-term predictions. I have no idea, but it's like, what I will say is that if the average person assumes, oh, the US dollar has 20 years left to survive, mathematically, inherently, it has to be sooner because you can't have the majority of people escape a bank run financially whole. It's impossible, mathematically impossible. FTX should be your shining example. The 2008 Great Financial Crisis should be your shining example. If you're operating a Ponzi scheme that is you know, violating conservation of energy in, in the underlying ledger, you can't have most people make out whole because it's not there. <laughs> And so if the average person in the back of their mind is assuming, yeah, maybe Bitcoin will take off, maybe in 30 years, um, the U.S. dollar will die, whatever, it's like it inherently has to be sooner. If the average person's expectation is five years, it has to be sooner. And, th and this is what causes hyperinflation is that what happens in hyperinflation is that this expectation of when the dollar declines gets pushed faster and shorter and shorter and shorter. And that curve, as people's expectations get shorter and shorter, that curve inflects upwards continuously forever until it's happened. So anyway, what does that look like for the US dollar? Yeah, it's it's gonna die. It has to die at exponential rate. And I would I would say is whenever it happens, it's probably going to be really fast. Maybe it's not for 10 years, maybe it's not for 15 years, but the last few years have been really weird. And we're already at 0% reserve ratios. I mean, every red flag possible has gone off in the last couple of years and we will probably get more red flags but it's like <laughs> they, they, it, they can't get much redder no they can't get much redder and every every additional red flag we have at this point is exponentially worse because it means that exponentially more people realize that this is not going to survive forever and we already all know it's not going to survive forever it's just a matter of our expectations and, and our time horizons becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. So anyway, that was a little bit of a rant, but it's just, it's so frustrating me how people assume Bitcoin is high risk and assume that the bank account, the FDIC is low risk. Oh, Bitcoin's not, not safe because it's not FDIC insured. It's like people respectfully, if you're listening to this, I mean, no offense to you, but respectfully, you have no idea what you're talking about. And I didn't at one point either. So, I've, I've said enough. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> so okay, right. Let's let's just uh, so the second thread, and we've touched on tons of points within it already, which is fine. Um, but it's based around your Bitcoin allocation from an investment point of view. So you're making the point um, a one percent Bitcoin allocation is all you need. And just to narrow down, just that so we can go into that in a second, but you've made the point that what the average entity, so commercial entity, will own in the future for Bitcoin in today's dollar terms, based on the distributions today, is $14.81 worth of Bitcoin in today's terms. Do you want to just, <laughs> it sounds a bit insane. Do, do you just want to, yeah. Yeah, let, yeah. On that. Let, let me run through that real quick for the people that haven't read the thread. However, not to toot my own horn, but I really encourage you to read it because the math is, frankly, it's devastating. <laughs> it's really optimistic if you're within Bitcoin. If you're not within Bitcoin, it's devastating. And here's why. Hal Finney in 2009 predicted that Bitcoin would eventually become the world's monetary stock, or at least has a high chance of doing so. And, you know, if it were due that, the global wealth in terms of Bitcoin would continue to climb forever. Well, the first chart I put in my thread is that exact chart. You know, he predicted that the, the first week of Bitcoin's existence back in 2009, it, it, Bitcoin would not cross one U.S. dollar until 2011. So two whole years before Bitcoin crossed one dollar, how Finney predicted this would happen. Okay, the last 14 years, Bitcoin has done nothing but do that. Continually, in a volatile fashion, the global wealth in terms of Bitcoin is declining. Okay, what does that mean? Bitcoin is eating everything else. It is eating monetization and every other asset. Granted, right now, it's very small, but it's been doing it for over a decade, a decade and a half now, basically. And so in my thread, I say, okay, what if this continues to be right? What if the trend continues? And Bitcoin eventually becomes the global monetary stock of the human race and eats monetary premium and everything. Okay, what if that happens? And we distribute this monetary stock in all the entities of the human race. And by entities, I mean humans, okay? In my uh, calculation, I put in 5.36 billion uh, adults because that's roughly what there are today. You know, maybe there's five and a half billion, maybe there's five billion depending on your definition, but there's roughly 5 billion adults. I put in 5.36 billion, okay? Then you have countries, okay? You, you have the balance sheets of nation states, and then you have corporations. So I, I believe in my sum total, I have like 5.4 billion, 5.5 billion entities that I say, okay, if we add up humans, companies, countries, you know, five and a half billion or so, because, you know, there's millions of companies and tens of thousands of large companies and a thousand mega corporations. But, okay, we, we put all this together and let's apply a typical Pareto distribution to it. So current um, wealth distribution, okay, Again, I got a lot of flack for it because, oh, you're too optimistic. You're making assumptions that don't make sense. It's like, no, I'm not. Current wealth distribution with the current trend of Bitcoin eating monetary stock. Do the math. I did in my thread. Go look at it. Go read it, please. <laughs> and just like you said, the average distribution is today 14 US dollars worth of Bitcoin. It, it's completely nuts. Like, oh, I'm too late to Bitcoin. I'll never own a whole Bitcoin. It's like there's only 21 million of them. Like, by definition, there can only be 21 entities that own one Bitcoin. It's like, you'll, like yeah, you in the future will not own a full Bitcoin, most likely. You know, I mean, today you actually have the chance to, but in the future you won't. In fact, you probably won't even know anyone that owns a whole Bitcoin, like statistically speaking. And statistically speaking, you may not even know anyone that owns a tenth of a Bitcoin, because there's only 210 million people who can own a tenth of a Bitcoin. You know, it, you know, you do the math, you look at my thread and you see quickly that, you know, when you do this out, that the, the vast, <laughs> it, it's, I, I'm going to lost the words, frankly. Um, it, it's so, um, the, the, the main point of the thread being that we are so late in terms of our timeline. We're already 14 years into this exponential trend. I mean, for everything like I said, you know, I mean, take the internet. The internet took 30 years to be globally adopted. Bitcoin's already 14 years through its adoption and it's being adopted 80% faster than the internet. It's like, okay, we're halfway through a timeline if we assume this is happening at the same speed as the internet and it's not happening at the same speed as the internet, it's happening faster. It's like, okay, our timeline is really short here and, and all it takes is like $50 or $100 or $1,000 of Bitcoin for the average person. It's like, that's all it takes. We are at the perfect time where 
uh, the the risk is low enough because it's clear that Bitcoin's a dominant proof of work consensus protocol in history. It's like there's no second best proof of work system. It's just Bitcoin. So it's like okay, the risk is so low, and yet the prob the probability of it continuing to survive is so high. Its hash rate just made new all time highs like two days ago. Even though its price is down. 70, 80%, it's more secure and more anti-fragile than ever. It's like, you know, the, the, the whole point of the thread is that we are at the very tail end of the early period of Bitcoin. And inherently for us to go from the end of the early period to full adoption, it, it's we, like our human brains are not ready for the implications of that on the exchange rate between Bitcoin and the US dollar. It's like, People aren't ready. It's like the, the only logical conclusion is that is that this happens. If adoption continues at the rate it's been going at for 14 years, if it can, even if it slows down, it, it's like it, it's almost terrifying. You know, let, let me put it this way. And I don't say this in my thread. So let, let me put it this way. There's 2 million Bitcoin available on exchanges left. Okay, 2 million. All right. So obviously exchange rates roughly $20,000. Okay, what, what is that? 20 billion for, you know, 20, okay, 20 to $40 billion of, it was what it would take to buy all of the Bitcoin left. Okay, okay. What if a central bank in the world decides, you know, we're going to print $100 billion and just buy them all? It's like $100 billion. <laughs> like, that's a lot of money <laughs> for me. But it's like, that is so little. It's like, okay, okay. What if Elon Musk says, you know, I want a 10% allocation. I want to sell... 10% of my Tesla stock or 10% of my SpaceX shares or whatever. And I'm just going to soak up all the Bitcoin. Okay. Like and this is already happening. Take Michael Saylor, my, Michael Saylor, one of the giga chads of the space <laughs> to, to use the term of the meme. Uh, one of the biggest Bitcoin bulls out there. He is one CEO of a relatively small corporation. He has bought 1% of the entire Bitcoin supply for the, the entire human race. One guy, one guy, chairman of, of his company, he took $4 billion, $4 billion, uh, you know, between selling stock and raising capital and, you know, his own, his own money too. And he bought 1% and they're gone. He's never selling. He's made it very clear. He's never selling. Um, you know, it, it's, <laughs> you know, people aren't ready. It's like every other asset we've had in human history, if the supply is soaked up and the price inflects upwards, what do people do? The incentive to produce more goes up. If I buy all the gold and, the, and I shoot the price of gold up, what happens? People go out and they mine more gold because there's an incentive to. Okay, take housing, you know, like real estate where I'm in. The price of housing has shot up. What's happening? People are building houses like crazy because inventory is so small and the financial incentive to create more supply has skyrocketed up literally along with the price. Okay. But Bitcoin, again, because it's a closed system, that's not what happens. If you soak up all the supply and people still want supply that's not there, the price does nothing but continue to go up until somebody is willing to sell. And we, we've, we've seen that on very small um, instances. You know, you, you hear about how this asset or that asset you know, skyrocketed up 10 X and the, you know, the matter of a few hours or whatever, it, it's like, okay, all that happens is because there's no more supply and somebody has to cover their shorts, their longs or something, you know, like we see all the time or in the inverse case, we saw that with oil back in the lockdowns of 2020 where oil actually went negative. You know, we see it all the time in minutia events where it's like, oh, wow, that was a freak coincidence where there was no more supply and everybody wanted it. And people just kept bidding up the price continuously until somebody was willing to sell. It's like, okay, what happens when you have corporations nation states and individuals all trying to buy the remaining supply and none of them want to sell. It's like, okay, Bitcoin's infinitely divisible. You have demand from numerous assets and from companies that can issue more and more stock and from countries that can issue more and more political currency units infinitely, indefinitely for an infinitely smaller portion of the closed monetary network. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I might sound a little crazed here, but I, really, I encourage you to think about this. If, if you're listening to this, you don't understand what I'm saying it. It's like, there's no limit to how much money that can be printed to buy this. It, it, there, there's only 2 million left. If, if there are 64 million millionaires oh. in the world, okay, if one in 30 of them say, you know, 
I want one Bitcoin. They're all gone. All of them. All of them. One in 30 millionaires say, I want a, a uh, what is that? 2% allocation of Bitcoin. They're all gone. You know, $20,000 is 2% of a million. You know, it, like, okay. <laughs> you know, the, the math just gets absurd. And, and the reason why there is such high pressure here, and one of the reasons why I'm afraid it's this is going to be very soon, is because for the, you know, for the first time, we have a continued decrease in in supply uh, of Bitcoin on exchanges. You know, until March of 2020, the available supply in exchanges did nothing but go up. But since then, it's only gone down. And now there's only 2 million left. And so it's like, it's almost terrifying to me. What if the next three years or next five years continues this trend and the number of available Bitcoins on the market continue to go down at the current rate? I mean, what's happening is that the total stock of Bitcoin left is being sucked out while liquidity increases on the network. That's a recipe for disaster. If you're not in Bitcoin, you'll be, you'll be on a sinking ship that's declining exponentially while the ship that is floating has an exponential number of people flocking to it. And eventually you just, yeah, it's never too late to get on a ship that's not sinking, but Every, that whole game theory here is just disastrous for every asset that's not Bitcoin. I, I, I'm going on a little bit of a tangent again, but it's just the point of my thread is uh, people don't understand how quickly this can happen because a technology curve is already fast enough. And when you add on top of that extreme financial stakes and the ability of the former system and the dying system to create exponential number of units within that system to fund the transition into the new system, it's like, it, this this is this is going to be the fastest paradigm shift in human history, and it, it's almost certain. All Bitcoin's already the most secure computer network in the world. It's like for you to assume not for you to assume this is not going to happen is for you to assume that the most secure computer network on the face of the planet is going to die. It's like literally before that happens, we would have somebody hack the nuclear codes and have a nuclear war. It's like anyway, the the risk is so high and the probability is so uncomfortably high. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's that's good. Um, it's very interesting. So, yeah, so just on that then, and I totally agree with what you're saying with regarding the uh, the printing of the infinite currency units into finite amount. Like what I, I think most people, you know, like if, if, if the price of gold was going up a lot, and this is what I don't think a lot of, you know, people understand that, that well obviously a lot do but a lot also don't like if the price of gold was to skyrocket you'd have tons and tons of gold miners out there immediately just like mining tons more gold and getting on the market which drives it the other way whereas bitcoin like that just can't happen um bitcoin miners obviously aren't mining more bitcoin they're mining into a fixed amount of bitcoin so you're in this very weird situation now where you have these two monetary systems and then you have fiat currency, which is, if the thesis is correct, is on the way out. Um, it's just a question of <laughs> if the thesis is correct, how fast that just becomes worthless. Because the fact that you can even borrow like fiat off your Bitcoin and stuff like that, it's like, it's almost like what Michael Saylor did. What, what did he do? He borrowed like $250 million or something at like at a couple of percent interest rate. Um, against something he knows that's on the way out like it's just when there's enough people doing that kind of thing by definition the other system can't coexist alongside with the current one if the thesis is correct like what we're saying about perfect money and stuff so that leads me to my next question then is there anything like what would it take to change your mind on this whole like is there anything that you think could happen that will make this not happen? Or what would it take in order for you to change your view on this? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I think it's one of the most important questions someone could ask. What would change your mind? So I think it should be said, especially since I've gone on a couple of tangents now, which I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, people, you know, people can sometimes hear what I'm saying and they think that I go out of my way to find evidence or find data points that fit my thesis. And actually, it's the opposite. Um, I initially got into Bitcoin because I was trying to prove it wrong. You know, like I said, I thought it was a, spe uh, a scam or speculation. And so I was like, okay, I should just go out and go ahead and prove it just so I know to myself that, you know, it's going to zero or whatever. And I couldn't. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized that I can't kill this thing. Um, and so now, you know, I've 
in my own mind, debunked pretty much every everything I can. You know, the whole idea, like, oh, it uses too much energy. That's a bunch of baloney. Uh, or, oh, what if the government bans it? What if it censors transactions? Or, you know, mining is not sustainable. Or a fixed supply is not good. Or you want the blah, blah, blah. It's like the hundred arguments that people give, it's like they're so old. They're so tired. They're so outdated. And they're just, many of them are just factually wrong. Many of them are just intellectually dishonest. And a lot of them are just a lack of information and just a question that somebody knew. So it'd be like asking, well, how is a locomotive going to run if it doesn't have legs? I don't understand. You know, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, so many of the questions just don't even apply. They don't even make sense. And so anyway, I, I won't get into all that for now. So there's hundreds of arguments that people make about it that just is not true. But what are the arguments left in my mind that are legitimate concerns? Well, I do have a couple. Uh, one of them is... If there's an unknown unknown, obviously that's the biggest threat. What if there's some sort of flaw in Bitcoin's code? What if there's some sort of um, error in, in, with, with the assumption we have in the network and it's, there's a bug or it's not actually closed or whatever? You know, Basically, there's a flaw in it that we don't understand. That's a real possibility. Um, I think that possibility is stupendously low. It's been 14 years. If there was a bug, if there was an exploit, hackers or computer geniuses out there have had 14 years to exploit it. It's out there in the open. Nobody's done it. No country, no company, no hacker, no group of individuals, no corporation. And there's been plenty of incentive to take it out. But I mean, basically what I would, the way I would put it is that if, if I could find a way to exploit Bitcoin and, or make a better one, I can make a hundred billion dollars, you know, just like that, you know, because it's like, and if, if you can prove it to the market, hey, I made something better without this bug or without this critical flaw, it's like the market would instantly transfer over to you. And people have made thousands of duplicates of it. People have tried to make better ones that have better trade-offs or whatever, and every single one has failed. So is that a possibility? There's an unknown, unknown, unknown and that the code is flawed or whatever. It's like, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, there's also a possibility that there was a dinosaur riding an asteroid, um, you know, th whatever, that's heading to Earth right now. And I mean, it's, it's like, sure, there, there's a possibility, it, you know, but, uh, sure, it's above zero percent. But all that to say is that that's, that's a possibility. However, it seems extremely small to me just because it's, it's been 14 years. The incentive is so high and nobody's done it and nobody would even know how to start. Like, it, I don't even know how to I don't even know how I would begin to attack it or destroy it. And that's the design of the system to be anti-fragile and resist attacks. So that's one possibility. Um, another possibility that I think would be a major problem would be if we had some sort of um, CME or EMP globally or, or something like that, like we spoke about earlier. Um, technically, Bitcoin doesn't need the internet uh, to, to survive. And a lot of people don't know that actually, but you could wipe out the entire electric grid and Bitcoin would still survive as soon as you turn it back on, or even if you don't, it, it would still survive, at least theoretically. But I, I do think that'd be a major problem um, that would, but again, I don't think it would kill it. I just think it would hinder it until humanity gets back on its feet. You know, if we have, and it's like, if that happens, you have much bigger problems um, than money. You have more problems like food. Um, so that, that that's a major problem, I, I think. And then another, another um, threat to Bitcoin would be if we find something that's, you know, five to 10 times better at doing what Bitcoin does. Uh, the, the problem is though, <laughs> I don't even know how you would do that, you know, because again, it's like an, a satellite in orbit versus a satellite that's not in orbit. The satellite in orbit is worth infinitely more. It, it's, it's, it is, does infinitely better. It does an infinitely better job of what the other satellites are trying to do. And it's like, I don't know how you get 10 X better than infinite. You know, if you have a ship that floats versus all the other ships that don't float, I don't know how you can make a ship that floats 10 X better. Yeah, you might, go, you might make another ship that's bigger or fancier or prettier or whatever, but it's like, if they both float, like, they, they both float. It's, it's, one's not better than... So, is it possible we find a better way to have perfect money than Bitcoin? Sure. But by, by design, the longest proof of work chain, the, or time chain, or blockchain, what most people usually call it, you know, by definition, by default, that one wins. And nobody's been able to make a better one. It's been 14 years, which in technological terms, especially nowadays, that's forever. And so it's like, okay, if we haven't figured out a better way to make it in 14 years, I, I'm highly skeptical we'll make it just from that reason alone. But then philosophically speaking, I don't know how, I, I, I don't know how we can make a better zero than zero. I don't know how we can make a better 
closed system than a closed system. I mean, even if new closed system is fancier, it's not a better closed system. It's just a different one. And by definition, the closed system, the longest time chain that's been around the longest, that one has to win. So and anyway, I, I might be getting a little too technical or using too much jargon for people. I might have lost some folks there. But basically, the only threats I could think of to the network are if we have something better or some inherent corruption with the network. Um, you know, the idea of perfect money itself is indestructible. And so the only question to me is, is Bitcoin that? And to me, all the evidence, all the charts, all the computer science terms that people want to understand, you know, just in every way I look at it, I see every indication that Bitcoin is this. And every possible imagination I have of a threat or a replacement to Bitcoin is either incalculably unlikely or it's destructive enough that it's just the end of humanity. You know, like I said, if we have a, a CME that wipes out the entire electric grid, it's like, yeah, that that could be the worst possible threat to it. But if that happens, your stocks are also gone. Your cash is also gone. Like everything else is also gone. It's like, you know, and then those aren't coming back. Bitcoin would come back. It would just be extremely hindered for a period of time. So what, what would change my mind about Bitcoin? Well, either one of those things or the possibility that I'm completely insane and my entire understanding of money is wrong, but <laughs> it, it, of what a perfect money, a closed system of all that would look like. And that that's possible. You know, maybe there's a 5% chance I've completely lost my mind. However, it's like, you know, it, it's just physics. It's just math. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, as arrogant as it might sound, I don't know how I could be wrong and how this could be wrong. Yeah. Um, if, it, I mean, the only obvious conclusion to me is that the future global monetary stock of the world, that's a closed system, immutable ledger and all that is the lowest risk asset. And it seems to me every indication continuously for the last 14 years and it's only becoming more and more clear because as Bitcoin gets older, there's less competition and it's getting stronger. You know, like, it's extremely hard to have a threat to Bitcoin today. It's like, you know, look, look at China. China tried to ban it five times and they failed all five times. Hash rates back up to like 20% in China. It's like China is one of the most effective totalitarian states alive today and they couldn't stop it. And Bitcoin's at like 0.1% adoption. It's like whatever odds Bitcoin has of dying or collapsing today, those odds will collapse by tenfold in the next five years. And then they'll collapse again. It's like, that, that's a... I know this might sound strange to people, but the longer Bitcoin survives, its potential upside only increases and its risk decreases. You know, we're in a world where higher risk equals higher return, more or less. But with, with the perfect money, with a closed system, it's the precise opposite. As its risk goes down, its potential return, its potential value in the future only goes up because it becomes more anti-fragile and it will have a longer time horizon in the future. So anyway, how, how can I be wrong? Um, I don't know if, if somebody can tell me how I'm wrong and they can convince me, I will pay them a lot of money. Like genuinely, that I, I dare someone, please tell me how I'm wrong. Um, but I have no idea. I don't know. And that's frankly what well, look. scares me. <laughs> <laughs> to your point on the hack, that's a great one. Just, um, and a lot of people don't think realize this, the fact that Bitcoin is open source, it's, such a huge monetary incentive to be able to hack something like this and it's like the entire market around the world no one no one can crack this no one can crack the code basically to unlock the bitcoins if um yeah. if it was all possible so look there, there, there's always uh -huh. um yeah go on yeah can i just add something to that just to give one more metaphor, and then I know we should probably go here, but just to give one more metaphor, I really think will help it click in people's minds. Because I know I probably just did a lot of jargon stuff that new people wouldn't quite follow. But the metaphor I would give is that of a black hole versus a planet. You know, put Bitcoin aside for a moment. Think of our current financial system, okay? As soon as you suck liquidity out, you cause massive systemic risk. Okay, look at us today in 2023. Everyone's talking about recession. You know, the housing market has big red flags. The stock market's down dramatically. We've had one of the worst years for a diversified stock and bond portfolio ever. It's like, okay, all that is because we had a 2% reduction in liquidity of the Fed's balance sheet or, or like 1.8%, maybe not even 2%. I, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's like, okay, that's an extremely low um, reduction of liquidity. And the system is so fragile that it's like shaking. Okay, take the great financial crisis, the GFC in 2008. It's like, 
what caused that? It's like just it, a minor error in, in you know, the, the fundamental structure of, of the economy pre-2008, and now that problem's even bigger, but that minor error, because the system is so fragile, it, it toppled. It's like a house of cards, you know? And so like a planet or like a star, the more massive you make it, the more mass you add to a star or you add to a planet, the less stable that system becomes because it's an open system. Um, you know, like, um, how do I put it a different way? You know, it's like the more weight you put on an open system, like a sinking ship, the more weight you put on the faster it sinks, you know, the, the more energy, the more mass, or in the case of economics and financial systems here, the more economic value you put in that system, the less stable it is. You know, like, like again, let's go back to the FDIC and depository institution, that, that whole commentary. The larger you make that institution, the more fragile it is. You know, it, it's basically like a bubble that gets bigger and bigger. And as it gets bigger and bigger, it becomes more volatile and less stable. And, um, you know, but <laughs> the difference with the closed system is that the more energy and the more mass you throw at it, the stronger it gets. Again, with stars or planets, the more mass you add, the less stable they become. The more mass you add to a black hole, the stronger you make the black hole. And that's what people don't understand. They, they live on these planets or orbiting bodies and they look at this little black hole that, that Bitcoin is and they're like, what is this thing? I don't, I don't understand it. it. It doesn't make any sense to me, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's probably going away. It's so small. Like, it's not possibly a threat. And my view is that, you know, it's a, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what's really happening here with energy transfer. Yeah, sure. There's more energy in your planet than in this little black hole right now. But all the mass that's coming to your planet only makes your planet less unstable. It makes your star less stable and of supernova more likely. But all the mass that is flowing into that black hole only makes its rate of growth faster and it only makes it stronger and it only makes its eventual consumption of the planet you're standing on um, more inevitable and, and sooner and sooner in time. And so what does that mean for Bitcoin? Well, this is the honeypot problem. The larger you make a monetary network, the more valuable you make a political currency unit system, the greater incentive you have to corrupt that system and print money for yourself and your lobbyists and your constituents. You know, it, it's, it's the honeypot it's, it's honey problem. The more valuable you make this um, open system, the more valuable you make this human uh, managed uh, network, the greater and greater you incentivize people to exploit it and the greater and greater the... Uh, eventual corruption of that ledger is, is going to have a trickle up or trickle down effect on the whole thing and, and the faster it's uh, go, going to collapse versus Bitcoin. The more energy you put out, the more secure it becomes. And so anyway, all, all that to say is that sure, there's a possible scenario in which Bitcoin dies. However, <laughs> the bigger it's become, the more secure it's become, which is the precise opposite of every other system we have today. The larger it's getting, the less stable it becomes and the more reliant we are on infinite quantitative easing and infinite money printing uh, that the larger it becomes versus Bitcoin. The larger it becomes, the more hash rate we have, the more miners we have, the more nodes we have, the more centralized the network is. And it, it's all that to say is that all your models are destroyed, as Michael Saylor would say, and it, it's the complete opposite of everything our human brains are trained to expect. Because up until this point, we've been dealing with horses. And the locomotive does literally everything opposite we expect. It's the perfect horse, even though it has no legs, it eats no food, and you know it's the complete opposite of everything we've expected. And because of that, I'm afraid a lot of people aren't going to realize that they have to make the transition until the transition's already occurred. And you know, what do you do when you have a bunch of worthless horses? <laughs> It's really good. Um, so yeah, just the one, the last point then on, um, to, to your point, what you're saying, I do think there's something to be said though. And I think you did touch on it that you look with Bitcoin, the common criticisms with Bitcoin, like there can be amongst Bitcoiners, there can be maybe a bit of an arrogance there because Bitcoiners are always right <laughs> or almost always right because we're regarding Bitcoin that no one understands it enough to actually give it proper criticism. So there may be some scenario out there that there may like when it, maybe five, 10 years from now, you have people at ultra high Bitcoin level understanding who have identified some flaws. I'm, this is very unlikely because it probably would have been done by now, but 
maybe there's something like that to be done. Like, just for example, economics, if you ever hear like those Bitcoin economic debates where you hear like someone like Saifedean Amos debating some Keynesian economist, they're always so bad and they're not even worth listening to because the Keynesian economist clearly doesn't understand basic things around Bitcoin. So it's kind of just just making the point that there, there may be something like that. But I think, as you said, it's probably a close to zero, like, probability but um yeah yeah who knows it, we're kind of in unknown territory with this thing so <laughs> yeah yeah and, and again to, to to really emphasize this point for people listening it's like yeah I, i'm not error enough to say i know this thing in and out enough like there's a zero it's like yes there's risk but okay yeah, yeah. So we know what do we know we, we there might be risk we don't know about but what do we know we know that the risk is very low we know that it survived 14 years with no oversight no management it a very high financial incentive to destroy with every incentive from the uh, Chinese Communist Party to destroy, every incentive from the U.S. government to destroy. Nobody's been able to kill it. Nobody, the Taliban's tried to censor it. It's like nobody has succeeded. And this thing is tiny. And we know as it gets bigger, it becomes more secure. Just, just for technical reasons we can't get into now. It's like we know that, that Bitcoin has a very high chance of success. Okay, what else do we know? We know that the U.S. dollar has to die, that the peso has to die, that the yen has to, we know they have to die. It's like, it, it's, it's so funny. You know, it's like people look at Bitcoin. Oh, it might die. It might die. It might die. It's like, yeah, sure. Maybe there's a 10% chance it dies. Shoot. Give it a 90% chance. Bitcoin dies. There's a 99% chance that the U S dollar is going to die. 99.5% chance. It's like by the feds own emission, by the U S treasury's own emission, by every, Everyone knows we have to make more money. We have to borrow more debt. We know that we can't cover our interest payments with our, our tax. But it's like, we know it's a Ponzi. We know it's dying. It's like, if there's a 1% chance that the U.S. dollar survives another 500 years, it's like, all Bitcoin has to do is be better. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better for you to justify an allocation to it. And so that's what, that, I, I guess that's the best way to um, end it here is that, yeah, sure, there's unknowns and there's new things and there's things we don't know, but... I would argue there's a very high chance Bitcoin could survive a thousand years and an even higher chance it could survive the next hundred years and even higher chance it's going to survive the next 10 years. And, you know, it, it, when it's the precise opposite for the U S dollar, I think there's a high chance. Um, you know, so anyway, all that to say is that when it comes to risk, I, I'm afraid people are perceiving risk the entirely wrong way. And the view of Bitcoin is a get rich quick, uh, low time preference, uh, option. And my, my warning to people is that I'm a very low risk person, uh, generally speaking, and I, I buy Bitcoin not because I'm trying to increase the risk. I, I buy Bitcoin to decrease my risk. I buy Bitcoin so I can get out of the FDIC and out of the depository institution and out of the UST, uh, US Treasury. I'm trying to decrease my risk by buying Bitcoin. And most people think it's the opposite. And I'm afraid once people realize that this is the case, that that's when we get a major... Um, crisis, frankly. What happens, again, let's go back to the millionaire example. What happens when one in 30 millionaires say, you know, I think I've been wrong about this Bitcoin thing. I think it's a risk off an opportunity and I want to allocate 2% just so I can protect myself, just so I can protect. Okay. That 2% from that very small group of people, that's all the Bitcoins. Okay. What if they do that? And then the US government realize, well, shoot. This, this thing is, is an important power projection tool for, you know, the Space Force or the Pentagon. We got to print a hundred billion dollars right now and buy all. The, so, well, sir, there's none left. It's like, what do you mean there's none left? I mean, you know, it, it's just, it's horrible game. It's devastating game theory here that Bitcoin is lower risk than the current system. And the only logical conclusion is to de-risk and get some allocation to the new system. But in doing that, you increase the risk in the old system, decrease the risk in the new system and you have a greater incentive. It, it's like the way I put it is that Bitcoin is basically an insurance policy on a house that's already burning down. And every time you buy that insurance policy, you're pouring more gasoline out of the house. And oh, by the way, the insurance policy is undervalued by a factor of a hundred. It's like, it, it's the most obvious thing that I, I can think of um, just with, with the way that the world's unfolding right now. And I'm terrified that in the next five years or so, people are gonna start to wake up and they're gonna realize I'm not sure about Bitcoin, but I need 1% just in case the house might burn down in the future. And then as soon as they buy the insurance policy, they realize, wait, I just poured gasoline on the house. Oh, wait, it is on fire. Oh, wait, it's almost burnt. It, it's just, anyway, it, it's, um, 
it's never too late to get into the new monetary system of humanity. By, I mean, that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's going to bring so much prosperity for people. It's going to be a wonderful thing. I believe that's my next thread, actually, that Bitcoin is going to save hundreds of millions of lives. Um, and, on, and it's just amazing the potential prosperity Bitcoin can bring for humanity. But the unfortunate reality is that the old system, by definition, has to die. Just like every technological paradigm before us today, that new system inherently destroys the old system. You know, internet destroys radio. Um, you know, printing press destroys, you know, the tablet. Um, you know, the light bulb destroys the candle. And it's like in the same way, Bitcoin destroys banking. It destroys fiat political currency units. It destroys a diversified investment portfolio and open monetary system. It's like Bitcoin destroys so much. It's a huge threat. It's undervalued dramatically. And even if Bitcoin has a 1% chance of survivability, it's, it should be trading much higher than it is today. And I'm terrified that it's more like 90%, not 1%. So, yeah. 100%. There we go. Brilliant. Brilliant. That was really great. Luke. So, subs, are you going to start like a sub stack or a medium or something as well as your Twitter? Like, I'm interested to bring oh. long form. Oh my goodness. I've gotten so many requests over the last two weeks. It, it's been so fast and everyone, yes, I, I would love to start all these things, but I, I just, I just started Twitter. Um, I, there are articles I want to write. I, I want to get on Substack. I want to get on other platforms. Um, uh, what, what's, what's the one called N Noster or, or what, what's it called? N Norster? Noster. Yeah. Noster. Well, Noster. Okay. Yeah. Everyone wants, everyone wants <laughs> know, me on I, Noster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it, it's been enough with the threads in the podcast, uh, one, one thing at a time, but yes, I want to do all of these things. Um, uh, and I'm going to bring as much value as I can. Um, so yeah, please follow me, please show support. Um, you know, I'm not making any money from this. I mean, eventually maybe I will, but, um, yeah, just show support. Yeah, Luke, I, I'm me... just going to say like, yeah, no, sorry. I, th I think you're going to be leaving your existing job soon, like whether you realize it or not yet. And you're just going to be working in this full time. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're, we're in Bitcoin, you know, and of, you know, it, um, you know, just statistically speaking, we're the first person out of 3000, um, to be in Bitcoin. And it's like, I mean, you know, the, the funny thing is I'm in real estate and kind of going back to earlier topic. It's like, I think, my, this profession is going to be gone in 80 years or hundred years, or maybe even less, you know? And so it's kind of funny that, you know, um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Cause it's like, I know my job is going away. I know the assets I'm saving is going away. And that's why I need Bitcoin. It's, it's being a broker and buying real estate is not a diversification, a part of my portfolio. It's a hedge against Bitcoin failing and the 10% chance or whatever percent chance Bitcoin fails. And, and that's what people don't understand. They think, they think Bitcoin is a hedge against um, something failing and they fail to realize that everything else is a hedge against Bitcoin failing. So yeah, either way, I'm going to be leaving my job if Bitcoin survives, okay. whether that's sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I, I suppose what I meant is I could see like right for Bitcoin magazine or something. Yes. I know. Um, I know. I know what you meant. I'm just like, expanding on that. What, uh... <laughs> 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 yeah. So, um, okay. Brilliant. That This was great. And look forward to doing it again at some point in the future. What is, uh, where can people find you? Like what's your Twitter handle, all that good stuff. Yeah. Luke Broyles, L-U-K-E-B-R-O-Y-L-E-S on, on Twitter. You'll find me, you'll see my face. So. Yep. And everything yeah, I do in the future, I'll like post the there. Fastest yeah. growing, like, yeah, yeah. Must, you must have like what the fastest, definitely on Bitcoin Twitter account ever. Cause when we first messaged and we booked this podcast, it was like, I think you had around like 2000 followers. And then I looked back like a couple of days ago and it was like, you're, you're now nearly like 6k or something. So it's, yeah, God, it's crazy. 6, but, um, yeah, people love what you have to say. It's great. So yeah. Okay. Look, thanks very much for coming on and we look forward to the next thread that's coming out very soon, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it.